Thanks, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's, it's a remarkable uh, honor for me to, have, uh, to be meeting such a large class in European studies. Um, I've been actually trying to found a European studies program at University of Pennsylvania for a couple of years with absolutely no success. Um, and uh, so it's a real pleasure for me to speak to some 70, 80 people who are, um, who are focusing on European studies um, here at the uh, US Army War College. Um, I, I should say just a teeny bit about my background, just so you know, I, I, I have a long history in European studies. I should say that um, I sometimes share this with my, my students on the first day of class. The reason I got interested ultimately in politics and European politics, I think, has to do with a lot of my personal family history. My father is a Holocaust survivor. He was a hidden child in France during the Second World War. Uh, my grandfather was in the French army. Uh, during that war on the Maginot Line. And um, they emigrated to the United States in 1950. So for me, um, politics has always been really important, important part of um, family life, important part of just a sense that, you know, what, what happens in the broader realms of politics really can have an important impact on you and your family. And that's, I think, why I became a political junkie from the age of six. I was, uh, I, I think I'm the youngest American for whom um, their formative political experience was the Vietnam War and the, uh, the end of the Vietnam War and the Watergate hearings, <laughs> um, which I watched when I was like six or seven years old. And, you know, the rest, I, I just, you know, I guess inevitably ended up in this story anyway, um, a professor of political science. And working on a number of different issues, uh, actually through most of my career, more political economy issues. So I'm, well, I'm very well, you know, happy if you want to talk about some of those things as well. This work that I'm going to present to you today is on international affairs, which I got interested in when I was working at Johns Hopkins SICE in Washington, DC, and organized some conferences around the time or just after the Russo-Georgian War about um, democratic backsliding in Europe and, and the ways in which <coughs> um, a new geopolitical conflict is sort of seemingly opened up in Europe. I've been working at it in a sense for 10 years, and that's important because, of course, the events that happened in the US happened a lot later than when I started working on this project, but that's a whole other story we can go into a little bit later in question and answer, if you like. So what I wanna talk about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk at a kind of um, high-level kind of area. I'm not gonna go into massive amounts of detail in my talk. I'm gonna hopefully leave some time for question and answer. Um, but just know that it's not because I don't have the ability to get into the weeds with all that sort of stuff, but just that I think that the debate is such that it's important to set the stage at high level, and I kind of like to work down from that a little bit. So what I'm going to talk about at first is um, what is at stake in this confrontation between the West and Russia. Um, uh, the different values, different politics, different economics. But I think at the top level of analysis, um, what's really at stake is different visions of the structure of Europe, of Europe's geopolitical structure. That the West has a concept of, the West basically has two institutions. I call it European Union Europe. You could equally, I guess, call it NATO Europe. Um, where there are two institutions, the European Union and NATO, that structure uh, security in Europe around a community of nations that's democratic, um, that follows rule of law by and large, that um, has certain liberal principles um, of human rights, et such. <clears throat> and um, Russia, for reasons which I'll explain, is not that thrilled about that type of Europe, that structure for Europe. In essence, the reason is, I'll go into in a second, Russia feels excluded from that structure of Europe and wants, in the end, to have a different um, geopolitical structure in Europe, which I call great power Europe. The notion being that um, for Russia, um, they would uh, prefer to have NATO and the EU either eliminated or downgraded, and instead structure geopolitical relations in the European continent along the lines of great power uh, coordination through something similar to the uh, Congress of Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, in which, um, I'll show you some pictures in a second, 
uh, the leaders of the major powers in Europe periodically got together to resolve whatever security challenges were at that time. And Russia feels, probably rightly, that were Europe organized in this format of a great power Europe, that Russia would have a seat at the table, which it doesn't have, for instance, in the European councils, or in NATO in particular. And not only that, but Russia might be prima inter pares, might be the first among equals in um, a great power Europe, uh, in the sense that they are, have often been, maybe not today, but have often been the biggest power, the biggest anyway military power um, on the European continent. So to describe that, um, I actually like to use maps. I'm trying to use this in my book, but I only have black and white printing. <laughs> And it's a little frustrating uh, working on this right now with the publishers. But if you look at this map, I, I mean, if you look at this map from our eyes, I think this looks like I would volunteer a typical map of Europe, right? This is a map you might encounter in a classroom. This is a map that would be, I think, unremarkable to most of us, right? Um, however, I would ask you for a second to look at this from Russian eyes. If you're a Russian looking at this map, what do you notice? <coughs> What's that? You're getting surrounded. Getting surrounded, yeah. And, and also, I think, for me, what I would notice is that Russia's gray and everybody else is blue. <laughs> right? And the blue jumps out at you from a graphic point of view. It's like, that's Europe. If you were, one of the key things I would say is like, that's Europe. The rest of the gray stuff, is that Europe? Or is that something else, right? Russia is, in a way, marginalized, let's say, at the very least, from this map of Europe. Arguably, for most Europeans, Russia isn't Europe at all. In fact, in the language that we just used a second ago, it's considered Eurasia rather than Europe, right? Because when we have taken, in, in colloquial parlance in the West, talking about Europe, we primarily are talking about Western Europe. And when we want to talk about any other part of Europe, we have to sort of modify that by saying it's Eastern Europe or, or Eurasia or something like that. But this is a, a, a map that may be worrying, I would, I would argue, to, to Russians. This is another one which I try to use in my book, um, which I would argue is even more potentially worrying <laughs> if looked at from a Russian point of view, which is a map of Europe. This is actually an official map of the European Council, the top decision-making body of the European Union. And it maps out Europe. I don't know if it doesn't really say that it's Europe, but I mean, it's presumed that that's, that's what the EU thinks of as Europe. And the European countries are all listed in jaunty colors, and they have their maps down there. But where's Russia on this map? Russia is the um, bland, beige background <laughs> to this happy celebration of European nations. So I, I find, and then this is my favorite uh, above all. This is not from an official source. It's from some map making company online. But it's actually one of the more popular online maps of the European Union. What I love about this is this is a sort of multi-tiered vision of Europe. Where there's a, and I think this accords very much with sort of Western perspectives on Europe. There's a top tier set of countries in Europe. Um, Germany and the UK and France, right? If you ask anybody in the US, where's Europe? They would say it's Germany and the UK and France, right? And then there's a sort of second tier Europe, which is the new member states like Poland. I met one of our colleagues from Poland or, um, earlier. And then maybe a third tier Europe, which is Romania and Bulgaria, and maybe Turkey, which is you know kind of trying to an applicant to join the European Union. And if anything, Russia and Ukraine and you know and these states are are presented here as sort of fourth tier <laughs> European states, right? Like with basically hopeless no prospect of actually ever getting into the European Union, right, is the kind of a message one might take from this map. I mean, if you have other takes on this, I'd be happy to hear about them, but that's kind of my, my read on this. So I think that the map that Russia wants to see, or I think would be more comfortable with seeing, are maps in which Russia is presented as a core part of Europe, and in fact, possibly one of the bigger powers in Europe. So this is a, a map of what I call Great Power Europe. This is, again, um, after the Napoleonic Wars, where you see that um, I think probably much closer to a Russian self-presentation of itself as a European power, 
uh, one of the bigger powers, in this case, controlling a big empire inside Europe, predominantly Poland, um, along with a few, a handful of other Western states at this time, empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the German Empire, the French Kingdom, the British Kingdom, the Spanish Kingdom. So for Russia, these are the, uh, this is the crowd among which they wish to hang, you know. This is the, uh, the grouping that would be amenable, I think. Um, and this is, I think, you know, from a Russian perspective, what great power politics looks like, right? Um, this, of course, is the Yalta uh, conference uh, towards the end of the Second World War, in which uh, Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin, you know, meet together to sort of divide up Europe, right? Um, or another picture, which is the Congress of Vienna, where the leaders of the, uh, maybe, I think actually in this case, maybe not the actual bazaar himself, or not the emperor himself, but their delegates are meeting in a room and trying to sort out European affairs, right? In other words, uh, what should we do about this? If there's a problem, who gets to take care of it, et cetera. And here's a more negative picture <laughs> I found online from you know, the Congress of Vienna. So for, for a great power, um, it looks like a stately affair. If you're one of the weaker powers, you might have a different perspective on these things where the top table of world affairs is occupied by these sort of czars and emperors. But if you're on the receiving end of that, what you see is that your territory is being sort of apportioned out here and there, you know, based on, you know, some sort of uh, small boy, boys club. By the way, also, um, importantly, at this time, it was a Christian boys club, right? So that Turkey... Uh, the Ottoman Empire was was always excluded um, from these events because as a Muslim power, they didn't have the same standing, essentially, which I think is just an interesting side note. But, um, but so this, I think, incorporates and encapsulates um, the, the sort of big problem that we face today is that from a European point of view and a NATO point of view, we believe generally speaking, that our institutions are working fine. They're working well, okay? The reason for that is because, first of all, the Cold War was won. But second of all, the, both the European and NATO, European Union and NATO, both not only give quite a lot of power to great powers, but they also provide a great deal of representation for smaller powers, right? Smaller powers, have their seat at the table in NATO, have their seat at the table in the European Union, they have the votes. Actually, in the European Union, Germany's vote is considerably lower than its population size should suggest, and the Visegrad countries can outvote, in theory, Germany. They don't, that doesn't happen so often, but in theory, um, the smaller powers banding together do have substantial power within these venues. Why is that important? Because the downfall of great power Europe and the reason that, that that's no longer the way West Europeans like to do business is because the great power of Europe collapsed catastrophically several times. It collapsed in the First World War, primarily, where a Serbian assassin, who was a Serbian nationalist, who was sick of his country being on the receiving end of Habsburg policy for so many years and being a, a, a small province there, threw a bomb into uh, Archduke Ferdinand's car, carriage, blew up uh, an important leader of the Habsburg Empire, and that was the spark that lit the First World War. The lesson that um, these small powers can't be ignored <laughs> safely, right? Because the small powers in Europe have always been the tinderbox that led to conflict. Similarly, look at the Second World War. The Second World War started when two big powers, Germany and Russia, divided up Poland. And that was the spark for the Second World War. So the lesson Europeans, and I think Americans, have learned from these two wars was that you, you don't want to create some sort of structure of international politics that excludes the smaller powers, because they have interests too, and those can actually be important in world affairs. And they can be triggers. Just like, for instance, today, Ukraine could be a trigger. Nobody would pretend, I hope, that Ukraine is a great power in Europe. But nonetheless, um, that is where war is occurring in Europe, and that is where you know, the most likely tinderbox 
for any sort of conflict to happen in Europe right now. So um, that's why um, the West likes what it, the, the sort of structure of the European Union and NATO, and I share those beliefs. But I think it's important also to recognize that for Russia, this is non-functional <laughs> as a setup. Because this setup, um, Russia doesn't fulfill any of the basic criteria to join that particular structure of Europe. Right? It lacks democratic institutions. It lacks a very strong market economy. It lacks a sort of culture of necessarily listening to um, some of the smaller powers. Right? And so it prefers to deal with things in uh, what today is called the Normandy format, right? where the head of Russia sits with the head of France and Germany and some other respectable states right, that are large um, you know, powers. Uh, and they would feel, frankly, insulted in a lot of cases to sit with um, the Polish prime minister or uh, the Belgian prime minister. Right? That would not be the way that they think things should work out. And, and in, indeed, Russia's, Russians, I think, believe that, at least this current regime in, in Russia believes, that the world is actually safer through this great, the operation of some type of great power mechanism, right? That, that they are doing this because they think that actually if the US and France and Germany and Britain say, um, and Russia sat down to sort out the Ukrainian conflict, we could agree that pretty quickly among ourselves and everything would be good. We wouldn't have a problem. Not a bad point. The problem being, what about the Ukrainians? <laughs> right. And would that be a stable arrangement? Right. And I think there's the sort of, there's the sort of problem in a nutshell. Um, that's just a very bad picture of a previous sort of um, phase where people were worried about you know, Russia sort of reaching out its tentacles everywhere. So um, another thing I think that we need to think about with regard to why Russia is engaged in this hybrid war against the West is that um, Russia, honestly, in, in a way that we find it hard to understand, believes that it's under an existential threat from the West. Okay. Generally speaking, we in the West do not see this that way. I don't think there's a lot of people who think that the West is about to attack or undermine Russia in a substantial way. However, Russia believes that to be the case. Since, 19, since uh, 2010, their defense strategy has been to avoid a Western invasion, arguing that that's typically where they've been attacked from in the past, and that that's what they need to, again, focus on in the future. Um, why, do they feel, why do they feel threatened? Well, one reason is that um, the West supports democratization in Russia which they perceive now as an existential threat to the Putin regime. I'm going to go quickly over these points. Secondly, um, that um, the type of economic reforms and economic transparency, you know, anti-corruption, rule of law, all that way of doing business that we have in the West is also an existential threat to Russia because that's not how they do business. And even if it's a question of, um, of trying to encourage those reforms in Ukraine, Right, which is a trading partner of Russia. That's a problem for Russia because they know that if Ukraine, for instance, were to go over to a Western style of business, to some extent that would exclude Russia and Russian businesses from operating there in the way that they wish. There's a whole other issue of liberal values that um, I think is also interesting. I'm not sure if this is quite as persuasive a point, but to some extent Russia appears to believe right now that Western values are uh, corrosive to Russia's traditional orthodox values, as far as that goes. And that is definitely a narrative that they're pushing. Um, what do they want to do? Um, I think a lot of this should be, is probably clear to this audience, but you know, the key things they're trying to do is undermine the European Union and NATO, split the United States from its European allies, undermine and infiltrate political processes, uh, remember, I started this uh, book 10 years ago. I was primarily working about Central Europe. But now we've seen that it happens in a lot of places uh, in the West. Um, and turn public opinion in the world against the United States. 
to be seen ultimately as and achieve the status of great power, which means to them having some type of sphere of influence in Europe and also being treated as a co-equal power among others in the European continent. I'm gonna equally go over this pretty quickly because I think it's well known and because in, especially among this audience and also because I wanna get to question and answer, I really look forward to that. So I just say that um, Russia has a lot of foreign policy tools at its, uh, I mean, it's not the strongest power in the world, but it, it has a wide range of tools at its disposable, disposal that it's using, including, it has to be said, conventional warfare techniques, right? I mean, so there is a conventional war going on in Ukraine at a very small scale. Um, but there is also uh, threats and, you know, of nuclear saber rattling sort of things. There's flyovers of airspace, flyovers of military vessels. Um, but broadly speaking, the campaign that Russia has engaged in since about 2007 has been largely not kinetic and more in the area of what we might call hybrid warfare um, and unconventional techniques. So a big part of that is information warfare. I feel like I, I hear about that every day when I open the newspaper in the US. I'm not gonna go into great detail about this, no, hoping that everybody's somewhat aware of that. But also there's a lot of um, espionage involved. Um, uh, in Germany, for instance, I think the, uh, the Russians um, hacked the Christian Democratic Party, they hacked the parliamentary website and a bunch of other public institutions um, been threatening to put this information, or I think did put this information online in the past week or two. Um, big data dumps. Um, the Russians uh, support Russians abroad. I was just talking to a student who was talking about the, uh, the Night Wolves biker gang. Um, you know, but basically the Russian communities abroad are, are, are sort of seen as kind of uh, sort of fertile ground to sort of run a variety of different operations among. Um, generally speaking, uh, and here's an area where I can claim to have sort of broken some news when I wrote in Foreign Affairs in 2014 that Russia had been funding um, right-wing parties, far-right parties in Europe. Um, I believe I was one of the first, along with Anne Applebaum, people to sort of write about that in the press, where um, a lot of this happens through sort of uh, suitcases of money, so it's a little hard to trace, and we don't, you know, you can hear about it in different ways, but it became uh, clear in public that uh, Russia was funding the, uh, the National Front in France, for instance, um, the Front National of Marine Le Pen, which is uh, the far-right uh, party in France. Um, and by and large is probably the biggest funder or external funder of um, fascist parties and far-right parties in the European Union, which is interesting because it sort of goes counter to the narrative that Russia often spins that we're fighting fascism, right? Um, they often say in Ukraine, the Ukrainians are fascists, we're fighting fascism, but in fact, Russia is, is promoting these parties. They may not promote them because they're far-right parties. It seems to me that the main criteria for Russian support for political parties is that they are anti-EU, anti-NATO, uh, so they could be from the right or the left, um, usually, and far, far right or far left, although you know, anybody who's taking an anti-EU line, and typically the parties that receive support from Russia um, speak out in favor of Russian annexation of Crimea in particular, and other uh, niche uh, foreign policy goals of Russia. So that's one thing, e each of these could be a chapter, <laughs> So you can have, feel free to ask me more. Um, Russia also, and you may be familiar if you spent time at NATO headquarters, has often used um, uh, sympathetic governments uh, to pr promote its policy positions within the European Union um, on a variety of different issues. Not every European government, but a number of European governments have been at different times um, favorable to Russian positions, and Russia will coordinate with them to make sure their positions are put forward in European councils, and probably a similar thing happens in NATO, although I'm less knowledgeable about that. What does the West want? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think that, um, you know, officially, um, you know, we want a uh, peace and prosperity in a law-governed Europe. That's the kind of general vision, this kind of your idea of a Europe whole and free, right, where it's free for capitalism, free for 
uh, human rights, um, trade and investment, um, and also, you know, um, you know, the, the European vision is really a peaceful vision, I think, you know, it, it, it's fair to say, from our perspective. Um, we want a Europe at peace. We don't want European wars. I, I would argue that's a key reason behind NATO. <laughs> and um, interestingly, the European Union itself even won a Nobel Peace Prize. I believe it was in 2006 or 2012. I can't remember which year it was. But in any case, um, you know, European Union really sees itself as a source of peace. It was an organization that created a, norm it created a long-standing peace among countries that had fought each other very frequently in the past, and therefore has had a very hard time understanding why anybody would see the European Union as a threat. Right? That whole concept is just bizarre, I think, for a lot of people, right? particularly after it won the Peace Prize. Um, and um, the EU does, of course, have a fairly well-acknowledged sort of colonial mandate right? <laughs> or colonial purpose, right, in the sense of trying to expand and enlarge, as, as does NATO, to expand and enlarge the zone of peace in Europe. Right? And that has happened, of course, to the Eastern Europe, uh, Southeastern Europe. Uh, arguably, the West operates a sort of mandate in the Balkans, um, in Bosnia in particular, um, where the concept is that we're trying to sort of, the answer to the challenge of the end of the Cold War was like, well, we have this zone of peace, now we just need to make it bigger. Right, and it, the more we incorporate people into our practices, the more peace we're gonna have, right? Which I think is accurate as far as it goes, but Russia has sought to sort of draw a sort of borderline on, on that. Our foreign policy tools, it seems to me, um, you know, the, the West collectively is, is far stronger economically than Russia, and also has military, you know, pretty, very substantial military superiority, as well as cultural, you know, you could argue, I don't know if superiority is the right word, but we have a lot more strength uh, and breadth in, in our cultural appeal. But I think that largely speaking in this conflict of Russia and the West, um, Russia tends to use these covert hybrid war techniques that are a little bit under the radar and coupled with kind of secure, with nu nuclear saber rattling. To sort of say, you know, back off, you know. Um, you don't really want to get into nuclear conflict with Russia, which is true. And the West has tended to respond to this by using largely economic means for similar reasons, because the West is not very interested in having a kinetic conflict with Russia either. But um, Russia cannot answer our economic tactics in particular sanctions. Why can't they? Well, simply because um, they're such a small economy. So if, if, if uh, the European Union and the United States, which are the <coughs> two biggest along with China world economies, boycott your country in any sizable portion, that is painful to you. And don't let anybody say otherwise. <laughs> the Russian economy has suffered enormously from the impact of, of joint sanctions by the European Union and the US, which have only been expanded in recent years. And um, just to give a kind of funny example of this, or not funny, but I mean, an example of how, how, how seriously outmatched Russia is in this area. When those sanctions happened, Russia decided to put counter sanctions on the EU. Because they didn't want it to be, you know, well, we're getting sanctioned, we have to do something. So, they counter sanctioned. Here's what they did. They banned food imports from Western Europe, primarily. So you can't buy, um, you can't buy Norwegian salmon in Russia. You can't buy French cheese. My family traveled through France, so I'm, I'm a Francophile, and like, I love French cheese, you know? <laughs> so this to me would be, and they also banned, uh, I don't know, Polish apples, um, you know, and, and ultimately, these things were mostly hurt Russia more than they hurt actually the West Europe. They caused food prices to go up by some 25% in Russia, which sent Russia into an economic collapse because people were spending more money on food, so they spent less money on everything else. And that increased the poverty rate, 
in Russia quite substantially. So their counter sanctions even hurt them, them more than it hurt us. In fact, I, I wager that most of you never even heard of the counter sanctions, right? Um, because they were just ir kind of irrelevant. You know, the only people who were seriously injured were Latvian, you know, um, milk dairy farmers who like lost a big market, but then you know had to find a new. But it, it had very localized impacts. Whereas um, the sanctions from the West, you know, is a big fear that it could be ratcheted up, et cetera. I think I made my point. Anyway, we we have a a huge ability to make pain for them, and they can't respond in that in that arena at all. Um, so the the dynamic I think you've seen unfold is that. Um, we have sanctions against them. They kind of have this hybrid war against us, and periodically these like sort of nuclear saber rattling. As well as, of course, they have other things like oil, oil and gas, etc. I could go into that whole oil and gas thing for a second. Maybe I'll just say two words about this. That um, one of Russia has tried to use its its huge oil and gas reserves as a way to put pressure on the European Union, and has been fairly moderately successful in that. However, the European Union has also been able to respond very effectively to that by uh, making all the European Union countries diversify their oil and gas suppliers. By, it was pretty simple. All they had to do was, in a lot of cases, was create interconnectors between the gas networks of different nations. And then all of a sudden, you could, and also build some LNG terminals. And all of a sudden, the US is a big exporter of gas to Europe. And more importantly, a place like Latvia has access to other gas other than Russian. So if the Russians shut it off, they can get Algerian or Qatari or whatever kind of gas coming in and they don't have to sit in the winter and be cold. Um, so through a variety of techniques like this, the European Union actually responded pretty forcefully to Russian gas pressure and, and actually forced down the prices and the ability of Russian to use that weapon. In fact, you don't really hear about it that much anymore because in the last year or so it's been very, very uh, much diffused. So um, what are the results? Well, here's the unfortunate part. <laughs> the results are bad, <laughs> right? So as effective as I think the, U the West has been through a variety of military responses, which I'm sure uh, you know, are more to the front of your mind in terms of you know, uh, troop uh, <coughs> placements in Eastern Europe, et cetera as well as the economic um, responses I mentioned. Um, the result is that, that Russia has only intensified the conflict, is only more determined right, to uh, make us pay um, than before, and vice versa. Right? So this, this is a conflict that although in the, in, the, in the minds, I think, of most Americans, I don't say about Central Europeans who are here, which is, they tend to take this more seriously for obvious reasons. But it's, it's sort of vague and it may not even be happening. But in fact, this, this conflict has been intensifying over the past couple of years and is only sharpening as these different sides are taking more and more measures. The other piece of what I wanted to say, and now I, I'm going to say maybe only a few minutes about this, is that. Um, that this type of conflict has caused huge prob political problems in Western democracies, and in particular in the countries which I call lands in between, that are most close to the conflict and that are in between the borders of the European Union and Russia. And I, what I do in the book in the lands in between is I try to summarize, which I've done now, you know, what the conflict is, but then also how it's affected politics in, in these countries. And the argument is that the that it's interesting and useful to look at the lands in between because the way that they've been suffering from this ge increasing geopolitical conflict over the last decade is very instruct, tells you a lot about what's going on in our politics in the Western and NATO countries. Okay. And the basic, the lesson's very basic. I try to make a very simple but poignant argument here, theoretical but poignant, which is that in general what's happened in these countries is politics becomes really polarized. So in Ukraine, for instance, they talk about politics as a civilizational choice, right? That, um, that essentially Ukraine or Moldova or other countries are making a choice between whether they want to live in Western civilization, 
or whether they want to live in Russian civilization. And there are different pluses and minuses for people in these countries. But it's a stark choice. On the one hand, you have integration into Western markets, which means a lot of competition. It may mean that your company goes out of business. right? It may mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, in, in Ukraine, in general, now it means national independence. So you have a majority kind of in a pro-Western perspective right now. But there's a very sizable proportion of Ukrainians who uh, take more comfort in the idea of a Russian-oriented Ukraine, who uh, have feel more cultural commonality with Russia, who understand the Russian way of doing business, who go to Russia to seek jobs and education, employment. And those two sides are really polarized. To the point in Ukraine, of course, they fight. Um, and not only at the front lines, but to some extent. Um, I was in Odessa about a year and a half ago. You know, there's, there's been street fighting. They're, they're frequent, frequent enough things where people on the pro-Russian side feel threatened. They feel not safe, necessarily. Stating their views in public. Um, going out and say, you know, marching for a political party or whatever it is, right? It's not, I don't want to overplay it, but, you know, it's a security issue for people. And so, and so politics is thus really, really polarized in these countries. Strangely, um, how the, the people who rise to the top in these societies aren't who you think they would be. You would think that the person who would rise to the top would be maybe the, the big sort of leader leading them towards the EU, like a Lech Wensa or something like that, or a Vatsal Pavel, right? These idealistic, moralistic leaders. Actually, what I found is that equally common, or more common, are leaders who actually find ways to play both sides, right? So the smart move, if you're a small country, where you have two big giants battling it out over you, is you have your hands reached out to both. And you find strategies. I would argue the richest man in this country is the one who's taking money from both sides. Right? So, and I have lots of examples in the book. Um, but I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you um, one. Okay, this is my, my favorite example i use in the beginning. But this guy, Vladimir Plotnyuk in Moldova. Plotnyuk is the uh, leading oligarch in Moldova. He's a bad guy, probably, from my sources would say that he probably made his money in ways that are not very good. Okay. Um, and um, he has nonetheless positioned himself as the leading pro-EU, pro-NATO advocate in the country, the head of the Democratic Party, which is the head of the European Union integration group in the parliament that's fighting a tough election next month to sort of stave off Russian influence and is getting big Western support. He's visited Brussels. He's visited DC in 2017. He even wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal arguing that uh, we need to fight Russian influence in Moldova. Interestingly, my sources say <laughs> that he is also a supporter of the biggest pro-Russia party in Moldova. Right, Co more covertly. Why? Well, if you're a bad guy and you want to have nice friends, you got to make yourself useful somehow. And one way to make yourself useful is to pump up a pro-Russian threat in your country to make yourself indispensable as the person who is fighting against that threat. That's just the political angle. But also, he's a businessman, and and financially, he's the owner of two largest uh, television stations in Moldova that broadcast Russian TV and all the political propaganda that goes along with Russian TV in these countries, right? Getting paid very well from sources in Russia, right? So he may be one of the more clever politicians who plays this, this game, right? And there's a lot of stratagems you could imagine to play this kind of game, which is a typical game, I would argue. This isn't you know, it seems weird for Americans, but it's a typical game that's played by small countries, right? What's that? The lands in between, yeah. In fact, they even have, there's a couple books that are really famous. I don't know if you've heard of a book called The Good Soldier Schweik. Uh, 
um, by Yaroslav Hasek. But anyway, it's a famous Czech novel where he talks about this guy who sort of, he'll, he'll act like he's going along with everybody, right? But he's sort of like, you know, just sort of trying to fool the big players to sort of play for himself. I would also remind, these, these people remind me a lot also of Catch-22. That may be more familiar here, of the character Milo Minderbinder, right? He's the guy, he, he's like, always has eggs. He's like, you know, working in the U.S. Army in the Second World War, sort of as a quartermaster, I think. But he's, he's the guy who always has eggs, and nobody knows how he has, he has all these things. Um, but there are other examples. Milos Zeman in the Czech Republic, who was, uh, um, who was repressed by the Soviets after 1968. He was one of the 68ers who was pushed out of power and suffered a lot. And he still, by the way, speaks up against Russia whenever they try to falsify what they did in Czechoslovakia in 1968. However, after a good career as a democratic politician, in fact, he was the guy who brought, who presided over Czech Republic coming into NATO in 98, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he had some political misfortunes with his Czech Social Democratic Party, he fell out of power, he was sort of lost in the wilderness, and he was found by Russia, um, who began to support him financially, and now he's taken an anti-NATO, anti-EU position, and is now president of the Czech Republic. Um, or Viktor Orban in Hungary, a whole long story about this guy, he's more in the media <laughs> these days. But this is a guy who's, again, the head of a NATO and head of an EU country, who um, has very close relationships with Putin. He has had many personal meetings with Putin. He has arranged uh, Russian financing for a big nuclear project in Hungary uh, where he's known to get kickbacks to his political campaigns. He's also tried to position Hungary as a hub for Russian gas pipelines into the country. And he's made no bones about this. He said, look, you know, anybody who Anybody who thinks that Europe can survive or thrive economically without Russian power is fooling themselves. And I want to play that role implicitly, is what he's saying, as a broker between, the, between these two sides. So I'm going to end there um, to leave some time for question and answer. Um, but just to say that um, the last line of my book is that this is a book about the lands in between. We're all lands in between. Because these very same pressures, the more we get involved in this conflict, the more the political impacts on Western democracies are similar to what's going on in the lands in between. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, could I just ask, if you ask a question, uh, could you use your mic? Or if you're not close to when someone around could press their mic so that the streaming and the uh, recording can, uh, can pick you up. Sir, Steve Capehart, thank you for being here today. Um, a lot of discussion in NATO uh, really over this last year over you know, the term of Article 5, an armed response. Uh, you have creation now of the counter hybrid support teams. That's a joint venture between NATO and EU. And so is it time for NATO to redefine Article 5? Uh, you've had the Secretary General recently discuss that maybe cyber attack is grounds for an Article 5 response. Just your thoughts on that, sir. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I guess that um, the logic of what I've been saying I've been saying is is yes, right? I mean, so if you take what I said earlier in a more general sense of like this is a conflict, right? And it's being pursued largely by by uh, hybrid methods. I do think that 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 means you know the implication is that one has to take these methods seriously, right? I there is obviously a question of how you want to respond, right? So I, I know I, I've talked to some and debated a little bit with some um, cyber people, right, maybe more FBI than military recently, who kind of feel that if you get cyber attacked, you should cyber attack back, right? This guy, he, he said we should make a keyboard bacon or something like that of <laughs> their computers, you know, like fry the, 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 the computers in the troll factory, for instance. And I think, I think that's an interesting question doctrinally um, of how you would want to respond. Because I think that the reality is that um, the Russians probably have uh, some, some level of parity with us in cyber. Um, but they don't have parity, as I mentioned, in the economic realm or other realms. So the question to my mind is, um, do you want to respond cyber for cyber when that's going to lead you into a kind of mutual sort of destruction kind of direction? Or do you want to kind of do, do something else? I, I see that as an issue. 
um, because I think things get kind of compartmentalized. Um, but I, I guess I do agree that we should regard this as a conflict in, insofar as, um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, that as insofar as Article 5 is about response to conflict or joint response to conflict, I, I do think that that may be, um, you know, important. Should I recognize people? I guess so. Lieutenant Kolchago from Albania. Sir, what's your perception of uh, Russia influence in the uh, Western Balkan and how they are changing uh, the U and NATO enlargement policy in that region? Thank you. Yeah, Western Balkans. Um, you know, they're very active, right? Very active. <laughs> um, Russia was was trying to um, trying to get Montenegro, you know, to have some sort of base in Montenegro. That was. They even went so far as to launch a coup against the Montenegrin government that ultimately brought Montenegro into NATO. I mean, I hear lots about Serbia, right? Um, so, you know, Russia plays all these same games in, in a wide array of countries, including the US, but including, you know, I'm sure Albania I know less about, but it's less in the news, but, um, but in, in other countries in the Western Balkans, no doubt. Um, it's a theater, you know, for them, I think probably their priority, they, they try to find, as far as I know, commonalities. So um, between, you know, or sympathies in Eastern Europe. So these are often pan-Slavism, which wouldn't apply to Albania, necessarily. <laughs> um, they also sometimes, uh, religious appeals, orthodoxy, which maybe does apply. Um, so they have uh, relationships with the orthodox churches. Um, and um, biker gangs, <laughs> et cetera, sometimes come to visit. A variety of different techniques. So I would say that, that all, that's a, a hot spot um, of this confrontation. You probably know more about it than I do in your particular country. I'd be interested to hear from you about it. But there's no doubt that, that this is not just happening in one specific location. This is a conflict. And this is in, maybe a general point we say, this is not like the Cold War, right? The Cold War, there were spheres of influence, and generally speaking, we kept out of their spheres of influence, for instance, Hungary 56 or Czechoslovakia 68, and they kept out of our, our sphere of influence, right, in terms of flipping governments. What's happening here is this is a hot war, but low intensity, right, across a lot of different um, venues, uh, the most hot being Ukraine, um, but really every country, including the U.S., is a battlefield right now in this aspect. Right, of hybrid conflict. Yes. LTC Macedonci from Kosovo. Uh, sir, what is your opinion? Uh, do you think that Russian established like long-standing uh, system that can survive after Putin, hmm. post-Putin? Yeah. So that's a great question because, you know, one of the key questions here is, of course, what do you do about this? And there's been a, a problem for the U.S. in dealing with this and NATO for dealing with this and that um, the U.S. has had three, as far as I count, three administrations in a row which has tried to reset relations with Russia. I think that George Bush too saw into Putin's eyes, he saw his Russian soul and initially he thought that he could really transform relations with Russia and then by the end of his administration we ended up in the worst relations ever, you know, with <laughs> Russia. Right? Obama similarly had this, uh, what I thought at the time was a ridiculous reset, you know, idea, which got off to a bad start when they misspelled reset on this, like, button that looks like it was from Staples, right? And, um, you know, and, but I think they were honestly trying to have, you know, manage a difficult situation and ended up in the worst relations ever, right? So, you know, and, and I think that, frankly, Trump administration is kind of going in a similar trajectory, which I, was thoroughly predictable. I believe that he, uh, in his own way, wanted to have better relations with Russia, and it's not worked out so great. Right? So, um, so I think that the problem is Putin, in essence, right? So the if you look at Russian history in broad scope, and I, I actually teach a course at Penn on communism, so I'm I'm like often thinking about Khrushchev era and the Stalin era and you know others, but every single president or general secretary of Russia has had a different foreign policy. It's very personalized over the course of Russian history. And the last two have been like really pro-Western, right? So Yeltsin was pro-Western, Gorbachev was pro-Western. Before that, Brezhnev, not so much. Khrushchev, not so much, you know, but 
he was, each of them were still different from each other uh, in very important ways. Um, so I think that Putin, a, a change after Putin will be very different. My bet is that it's hard to see how this becomes more anti-Western. Most likely the next president of Russia will take some lessons. From, and the lesson is this highly confrontational approach is probably not a good idea. Um, and you know, this is the, 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 another important background to the conflict is what's Putin thinking? He, he's thinking, I think, that his back is up against the wall. If he doesn't deliver results, Right, he has faces serious political challenges that, in in Russia, mean a whole bunch of uncharted territory you don't want to go to. So, um, so I think that um, that we will see a big change if there is a regime change. But that's the reason he's trying to hold on to power and trying to win this conflict, you know, in a sort of big swoop, um, you know, sort of strategy where he's, he appears to me to be taking more and more risks. Which of course carries more and more risks for himself as well. Yes, sir. Um, Tim McGrew from Seminar Seven. Well, you talked about Russia's relationship with China and how they are trying to leverage that to increase their standing as a great power um, within this global world order. Yeah. So, so i've been talking about europe but in a broader world scope you know russia's strategy is the same they want a multipolar world in which they are one of the big world powers right so kind of a un general council the general you know sort of um, security council a rather uh, perspective is kind of how they would like to view the world right and uh, china is an important partner um, for them however china is also a threat to russia right arguably um, china is a bigger threat to russia um, than the West is um, in terms of um, it has this huge booming economy, population. Um, it's right next to parts of Russia that are depopulated, increasingly depopulated, uh, and have a lot of resources which China might want. And so there are issues, you know, there. And I don't know how quick you're going to see Russia, the Russian part of the Belt and Road, be built. You know, uh, probably may never happen. You know. Um, so, um, so I think it's a it's an interesting relationship. But of course, right now, as you mentioned, Putin does try to leverage a, a, the threat of a closer alliance between Russia and China against West against the West as you know another reason not to go there, another reason not to have a confrontational relationship with Russia and to do the deals that they want to do. Um, and and a, a similarly, I would say Iran. You know, in a much smaller scale, right? It's similar sort of way. They, there's there's um, commonalities and also challenges in those in those relationships. Um, I, I guess that um, you know, I, I guess I would maybe just leave it there, you know, without getting into just a whole lot of stuff. But just to say that um, it's challenging, and China has the upper hand in that relationship. Um, and some things haven't already worked out. For instance, you know, pipelines, you know, became much more expensive. Um, I don't know. So, um, so of course, it is. It is a challenge. It is a threat. It is an issue, right? Um, but I think that um, the United States actually has a much stronger position in a lot of ways with China than Russia does. If you think about economic interests and. Um, yeah, but but China probably does try to use Russia as a way to sort of, you know, knock down a bit the Western geopolitical level. On the on the other hand, I don't really know how much they actually want to take it apart, <laughs> as much as sort of rise within it. So that's an interesting focus for another another day. But uh, I hope I gave you some insight there. Yes. So, Axelhardt from Germany, I may I ask you for the so what? Uh, yeah. So, if you would have a white piece of paper and you could recommend the main three points for a Western political leader, how to handle Russia? Well, um, so I think that I think that the biggest challenge for the the West, and I didn't get into the politics of how this affected the West too much. I left that very implicit, but I think everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? The the Russia intervened in all the recent Western elections, including the 2016 presidential election in the United States, to some extent in the German elections, 
um, pumping up the AFD, um, providing funding to AFD. <coughs> Certainly in France, uh, promoting, you know, supporting a number of candidates. Um, they're active everywhere, right? And so um, in Brexit as well. Um, the biggest funder of uh, the Brexit campaign in Britain has uh, interesting relations with the uh, head of the Russian delegation in the UK, and nobody knows where his money came from. Um, so, um, so I think I think honestly, the biggest issue we face, and this is why I wrote the book the way I did, um, is getting the general public to understand that we're in a conflict and that there's a problem. I think that is the reason why you're going to see over the next year the US Congress have uh, hearings, public hearings, televised public hearings. They're going to garner a great deal of attention because people want to see people on TV admitting uh, to things that they've done and relationships that they've had with a hostile foreign power. So I think that for the West, and I say that because I'm actually quite happy um, with the way um, the process is unfolding in the US, because I think that um, honestly the public information and the admissions and um, the investigations that are ongoing from Mueller are gonna be very cathartic for the United States in sort of recognizing the dimensions of the issue. However, other Western countries have not engaged in anything similar. So for instance, in particular, I follow UK politics quite extensively. And the UK has not investigated or not made public the investigations about Russian influence in Brexit for obvious reasons because the government's committed to Brexit. <laughs> and they don't want another scandal to sort of engulf that issue, which is a very complicated and sensitive one for them and their international partners. So um, I think the first step that the West needs to take is a thorough accounting and thorough transparency as much as possible over what actually happened and people willingly um, uh, cooperating with the foreign power in um, places that they shouldn't have been in electoral processes. Um, and that would be a precursor to what is probably even more important, which is ultimately that there are several basic things that the West can do that aren't all that difficult or expensive to counter information campaigns, et cetera, that have not been done because political um, structures and political individuals and people and politicians have just been unwilling to undertake those actions. Um, so counter information campaigns, right? Um, we've seen in the West our, our, our big social media companies not rise to the challenge Right, of trying to uh, protect the information space. So there, there are a number of rather obvious um, you know, tech tactics can be used in the information space that have not been availed of simply for political reasons. I think that would be the number two place I would go. So I'll maybe stop there. I think the third thing obviously is some sort of more modest other, you know, the economic and military things also need to be pursued. But I see those as happening you know, to some extent. Very briefly, Martin, if you could. Sorry about that. Yeah. Right. Right, yeah, so taking more, your point is to take more resilience measures rather than what could be perceived as aggressive military measures. I think to some extent military measures need to be made or indicated. But I agree that probably we have much more work to do and can do a lot more in the economic realm and much more work to do we haven't done in the information, in the information realm. Um, so I think that would fit into resilience to some extent, so. And I 